Hey, good morning, everyone. Yeah, welcome to to the tutorial today on this uh, sports day. So let us start the tutorial now. We are going to talk about a new topic called counting. I believe a lot of you have already studied this in your high school, but nevertheless, if you haven't, then don't worry because we are going to teach you starting from scratch. So we will introduce a couple of uh, basic results, but they are fundamental and can build up all the results that we are discussing in this uh, series of lectures. So the first one is called rule of thumb. So imagine this scenario. We are looking at the Pizza Hut and the Pizza Hut is uh, having a lot of uh, different kinds of meals serving for us. So you may order pizzas or you may order pastas. So there are various choices. And then suppose that Bruce is somebody who wants to try a different meal from Pizza Hut every day. If he wants to try each meal once, so how much time does it take? So it is actually very easy to compute. So we just need to count the different kinds of pizza that he, he can order and also the different kinds of pasta that he can order. Then we simply add these two figures up and then we will get the result. Now con consider a different scenario. So this is called the rule of thumb. So rule of thumb is used when we are counting uh, the number of ways that we can do something such that there is m way to do uh, in one way and there are n ways to do in another way and we want to make a choice of either these the first type of ways or the second type of ways so we're using or so this the first type or the second type so the total number of ways is just simply adding up the two different possible number of ways okay now let us take a look of a different scenario this time, suppose that uh, we are also considering the drinks. So there are various kinds of drinks that we can order from Pizza Hut. So let's say there are five different kinds. One, two, three, four, five. So each day, Bruce wants to take a drink and also with a particular meal that he wants to order. So previously, we have computed there are 15 different meals that he can order. And now there are also five possible drinks. So each now regular meal will have a drink with a pizza or a pasta. So how many different combinations are there? So this is also easy to get. Okay, so it turns out that there are going to be 15 times five different choices. Okay, we select one of the meal and then we are selecting one of the drink. So this is the case that we can apply rule of product. So if a certain thing that we are trying to count will require, we, we need to select uh, the first type and then the second type. And then let's say the first type there are n ways and the second type there are n ways. Then in this case, the total number of ways to select the first type and the second type together, okay, will be m times n, okay? And then, okay, so this is another example that we have explained in a class. So we want to count the number of different ways that we can travel from A to B. So one thing that, oh, okay, if you look at this diagram, okay, this is called a graph. There are certain nodes here or vertices here, and then there are edges joining between the, 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 the vertices. So these edges represent rows. So, so we need to follow the direction of these arrows. So for instance, there is a one there is one way to travel from A to B by using this one, going to this one, and this one, and this one. Is that okay? And then we cannot go to this one because the direction is not correct. There is another way, going to here, 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 and here. So we want to count the total number of ways that we can travel from A to B. So one one thing that we can do here is that in instead of just computing the number of ways to go from A to B, we compute the number of ways that we can go from A to any point here. Okay, now if we are doing something like this, then it may simplify the problem. We are trying to compute more information and then make use of the computer information to help us to compute the, 
the new information. So what we can see here is that, okay, this is the easiest case. The number of ways to go from A to A is one way. Notice that this diagram or this graph will not have cycles. So we don't need to worry about going from one place and then going to some other place and going back again. So we don't have any cycles here. So in that sense, so once we have computed the total number of ways of a certain point going from A to that point, then there is no other new ways. Okay. So from A to A, there is one way. How about A to this point? Now notice that for this point, it can only any any way to go to this point must start from must come from A, right? Because for this for this vertex, there is just one incoming arrow. So there are one way to go from A to A, so that means that there is also one way to go from A to this point. Now this one is slightly different. Okay. This one is if you want to go to this point, either you go from A to A here and then travel this edge, or you go from A to here and then travel this edge. So for this particular vertex, there are two different ways that we can reach it. Either using this incoming arrow or using this incoming arrow. So in that case, we just need to add up the number of ways here and here so that we know that the total number of ways here. So it, it will be equal to two because one way here and one way here. And similarly for this one, if you want to reach this node or this vertex, you must either use this incoming arrow or this incoming arrow. There is one way here, there are two ways here, so altogether there are three ways here. And similarly, there are two ways here, two ways here, three ways here, and there are going to be five ways in B. Notice that we are just applying what? Applying the rule of thumb. Another example is we have, a, we call this a pen balance. There are two pens here. It is a balance that we can use it to measure the weights of some item. Suppose that we have some standard measuring weights here, and then let's say there are n of them. We can use these measuring weights, put it on one side of the pen, and put the object that we want to measure on the other side, and find out how heavy it is. So with n so let's say we have n given standard weights. What is the greatest number that we can measure the object? I mean, greatest different amount that we can measure the object. So for instance, let's say I have a measuring weight of one unit and a measuring weight of two units, then I can measure weight of one or weight of two or also weight of three because I can use both together. So with two measuring weights, I can measure here in this example, I can measure up to three different possible ways. In general, if I have n, then how many different amounts that we can measure? Now it turns out that the maximum, the greatest number of different amounts is no more than 2 to the power n and then minus 1. The reason is that we have n measuring ways. For each of these measuring ways, we either use it or not use it. So the end choice that we, we can make because each time when we want to measure, we are either choosing or not choosing a particular measuring weight. So we either choose or not choose the first one, either choose or not choose the second one, and so on and so forth. So there are altogether two to the power n different choices that we can make. And then there is one choice that that is uh, we are not choosing everyone. So it is actually corresponding to measuring the object with weight zero, but there is no object with, with weight zero. So in that sense, the different amounts that we can measure, the number of them is at most two to the power n and then minus one. Okay, and then, yeah, so this is a challenge. So this time, suppose that uh, my friend, Alison, she wants to measure different items such that the way is no, the weight is known to be between 1 and 100. So they are all inti integral weights. So how do we design a minimum size of measuring weights? So first of all, we need, we, we have 1 to 100, right? So there are 100 different amounts that we need to handle. 
So in that sense, we know that we need from this answer we need at least seven, because two to the power six is only sixty four. So we need at least seven of measuring ways. So now is it possible to get seven? So it is rather easy if you think about this greedily, because we need to measure weight of unit. One one weight of one unit, so we need the measuring weight of one, and then one is not enough to get us two. So let's have a two for our second measuring weights. So with one and two, we can get one two three. Now we cannot have four, so let's get a four. So now with one two four, we can measure different weights starting from one two three four five six seven, right? So using this observation, we will see that. If we have the measuring weights of one, two, four, eight, sixteen, thirty-two, and sixty-four, we can actually use these seven measuring weights to get or to measure objects of of the weights from starting from one, two, three up to one hundred and twenty-seven. So this will be something that we can solve for Ellison's problem. Okay, now as another example, so so here we want to count the number of devices one four zero zero has. Okay, how many devices one four zero zero has? So we are not trying to list out all the devices. So in our primary school, when we study numbers, we are listing out all the devices and counting them. But there is a faster way if we just want to count the total number of devices. This method is by doing factorization of one four zero zero. So after making one four zero zero, uh, into its factor, we get it is equal to two to the power three, multiplied with five to the power two, multiplied with seven. So these are the prime factors, right? So this is the prime factorization of one four zero zero. Now we know that for any divisor, ah, we need a theorem called the unique. Prime factorization of a number, but this is studied in primary school. We are not proving it now, but you, if you are interested, you can prove it. Uh, because we have already studied methods of proving already. Eh? Did we? Oh no, maybe not. But yeah, we, did we? Yeah, we we have right. So we we can prove it. Yeah, we have already studied methods of proving. So we can actually prove the prime unique prime factorization theorem is correct. But let's assume that it is correct for now. We we now know that any factor or any divisor of one four zero zero must have some number of twos inside, some number of fives inside, and some number of seven inside. The number of twos that can be formed inside a factor or a divisor of one four zero zero can can range from you may have zero two, you may have one, you may have two, you may have three twos in the in the divisors. Factor okay, so the choice of how many twos the divisor will have, there are three plus one choice because you can you can have zero one two three, the number of fives that we can we can have for a particular divisor is there are three choices, either you have zero five one five or two fives, for seven either zero or one. So in that case, the divisors either need to choose. The number of twos, and then the number of fives, and then the number of seven. So the total number of choice that a divisor can take is twenty-four. So for instance, let's take a look. Ten is a divisor, right? So when we have the divisor ten, how does ten come from? Okay, ten comes from choosing one two, one five, and no seven. Okay, and how about this two hundred? So two hundred comes from Choosing three twos, two fives, and no seven. So for all the different combinations, so there are twenty four of them. So each one corresponds to a certain choice of number of twos, a certain choice of number of fives, and a certain choice of number of sevens. Okay. Another example. So, so this is not a difficult example, but then, but then it is kind of a trap. Okay. So let's see. Suppose that there are five Chinese books, seven English books, and ten French books. 
we want to find out how many ways that we can choose two books of different languages. Now, there is no single formula for this one. But on the other hand, it is rather easy if we combine the use of rule of sum and rule of product together. So separate. First, what we can do is separate the cases into, so we want to get different language, right? So maybe we are picking Chinese and English. This is one choice. Or English and French, another choice. Or Chinese and French. This is a third choice. Is that okay? And then we count the number of ways that we can do for each individual choice. So we can add them up as a result. So the number of ways to get Chinese and English is 5 times 7. So we are using rule of product here. Chinese, French, 5 times 10. English, French, 7 times 10. And then we add them up together using the rule of thumb. So we get the answer. There is also another way of, of solving this problem. So in order to get two books of different language, another way that we can do is we are using subtraction. We first find out the number of ways to get any two books. Okay. And then this is over counting. We are counting some of the cases that we don't like. For instance, we don't want two Chinese books. We don't want two English books, and we don't want two French books. So we get the total number of ways of getting any two books, and then subtract from it the number of ways to get two Chinese books, and also subtract from it the number of ways to get two French books, and also from it two French books. Okay, so, so this is another way. So and this is another easy example, so I will leave it for you to, to study. And one more thing, okay, so this time, so we have talked about rule of sum and rule of product. So this is an, another rule. We call it the principle of inclusion-exclusion. So this principle says, this is the basic form, or this is the simplest scenario. Suppose that one thing can occur in n ways or n ways, but these two ways, there are common ways in between them. So when we talk about m ways and n ways, there are actually some of the ways, let's say our ways that are common here. So in that case, the total number of ways should be counted by, so suppose that we can do in any of these ways. So the number of ways that we can do should be counted easily by, you add m and n together, m plus n, but then you should deduct something that is over counted, so you minus r. So this is called the, inclusion exclusion principle so we include all the ways of doing one thing but then we exclude the ways of doing two things in common as an example so let's say there are 350 applicants for a job and then we know that out of these applicants 220 of them they have major in cs 147 of them they are major in business. So here it is rather strange. You have 220 in CS, 147 in business. If you add these two together, it is already more than 350. Okay, the reason here is that major doesn't mean that it is a single major. So there are students with double major in both CS and business. So there are 51 of them with double major in CS and business. So in that sense, so there are actually some other applicants who, who are neither having a CS major nor a business major. So we want to find out how many of them. So how do we do? What we, we can do here is we, we can count the total number of applicants with major in CS business or both. So to count it, it is easy. We use inclusion exclusion. We add these two and then minus 51 because we are over counting 51 of them. So after doing the calculation, there are 316 of them with a major in CS or business or both. So the remaining one, remaining out of these 350 out of them, they must be coming from neither CS nor business. So we can solve this problem like this. Okay, another way of solving a counting problem is we can use a tree diagram to help us. 
So tree is a concept. It's a special kind of a graph. So we have talked about graph before, right? Graphs, they are vertices. And then between vertices, there are edges. So in this diagram, focus, forget about the red one. Just look at the blue part, okay? The blue part is a graph. And then this graph is special. There is a vertex that is placed on top. We call it the root. And then every other vertex is like, like, like connected to, to the roots. I mean, either directly or indirectly in a certain way. So this diagram can be interpreted is we start from the root. The root will connect to some of the vertices. And then these vertices will further connect to some other vertices and so on and so forth. And then there is one thing that is interesting is we don't connect. So in this graph, there is no cycle. So a tree, so we call this a tree. A tree is a graph such that it is a graph that you can reach every vertex starting from the root. So we call it a connected graph. Everything is connected together and there is no cycle. And we can use this idea to help us to sort out our thinking process. When we want to count the number of ways of doing something, we start from the root to represent we have not made any decisions. And then we go to the different branches starting from the root to represent we are making a different choice. And then these choices are, I mean, they are they are not overlapping. So let me use an example to, yeah, so this is a, so a branch represents a choice. And then finally, if no choice needs to be made anymore, then we will reach something that you don't have any further, uh, I mean, uh, branching. So we call these leaves. So the number of leaves here is the number of possible ways of doing things. Okay, so maybe it is too, I mean, high level. So Let's see. Let's see a, a particular example. So we want to find out how many bit strings. So bit strings are a character uh, word that is using 0 and 1 as its component. So a bit string of length 4 could range from 0, 0, 0, 0, and then 0, 0, 0, 1 up to the string 1, 1, 1, 1. Okay. And we want to find out how many of them do not have two consecutive ones. What we can do here is we are we can list out all the strengths one by one cleverly using a tree that determines the bits one by one. So we start from the root, which represents we don't have any decisions now, but then the first bit of the string could be a zero or could be a one. Now let's look at the side on the right hand side because it is more interesting. Okay. Now suppose that the first bit is a one. Then in order to satisfy this condition, we don't want to have two consecutive ones. So we must have the second bit to be zero only. So the second bit is zero, the first bit is one, one and zero, and then the third bit, it could be zero or one. But if the third bit is one here, then the fourth bit should be zero. Is that okay? So we use this to draw out all the different ways that we have. So we can have zero, 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 this is one way, or zero, 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 one. 0, 0, 1, 0, and so on and so forth. So after doing this counting, then the total number of ways is equal to the number of leaves here because each leaf corresponds to one particular outcome. So there are 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 8 ways. As another example, suppose that we are looking at this uh, common uh, rule of playing games between two teams. So we have best of five. So there are at most five matches between two teams. Whoever gets three wins will win the game. So how many different ways can the game be conducted? Okay. So suppose that somebody so 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 here there are two teams. So I'm using the, the the label one and two to represent whether team one or team two is winning. And then we start looking at the games from the first game and then the second game and so on and so forth. So the result of the first game could be one winning the first game or two winning the first game. So there are two different choices. So you have two branches. 
But if one is winning the first game, then the next part is one could be winning or two could be winning. And then suppose that one has already won two times and then the third time it could be one winning, right? But after one has won three times, then there is no more branching because the, the winner is already decided. So in that case, there is no branch. So another choice of how the game can proceed is maybe one, one, two, two, one. Is that okay? Because after this, we have already played five games and then one is now winning three times. Is that okay? So if you count the possible, so these are the leaves of this tree. So if you count the number of leaves here, then we know how many scenario that we can have. Now notice that we can count a little bit cleverer. Yeah, because the this game is kind of symmetric. If we count the things on the number of leaves on the left hand side, we just need to double it so that we can get the total number of leaves of the whole tree. Okay, so that's that's for the tree diagram. Okay. So this is the lecture seven. And let's take a look of a few more slides from lecture eight. Okay, excuse me. Give me some time. I want to connect uh, my computer to a power cord just in case that uh, we we may run out of battery. Okay. So lecture 8 continues our discussion on counting and in particular we will talk about two special types of problems called permutation problem and combination problems here. We will define what is meant by these two terms and then in the end we will talk about the interesting identities. So the latter part is reserved for the next class. Okay. So in a lot of counting problems, we are dealing with selection problem and arrangement problem. So selection of objects and also arrangement of objects. We want to compute the number of ways to do so. So as an example, so we want to, so suppose that we have five people that we want to pick and then we want just two of them. So how many ways are there to select two people out of five people? So this is a selection problem. And then the other case is, let's say we have seven books. So how many ways can we arrange the seven books on the bookshelf? So assuming that we are arranging the seven books on the line, starting from left to right. So how many ways are there to make this arrangement? So this is another problem. So we want to count the number of ways. Selection problem is called a combination problem in math. And then we can talk about, suppose that we have n objects, a combination with R object is called an R combination. So this R here is an adjective to describe how the combination looks like. So a combination of N objects means we are selecting some object from these N objects. And then a, an R combination here, it describes the number of objects that we are actually selecting. So for instance, suppose that we have five objects A, B, C, D, E to be selected. And then we just need two of them. And then C, D will then be a particular two combination. Similarly, arrangement will have another name. In math textbook, it is usually called a permutation. So suppose that we have n objects to begin with, and then we want to get a number of items selected and make an arrangement of them then it is called the permutation of these n objects. R permutation describes the number of objects that we are selecting. So for instance, we have five objects, A, B, C, D, E, and we are only selecting four of them and to create a particular arrangement. Then in that case, C, A, B, D is a permutation and it is also called a four permutation because there are four items inside. And we are dealing with counting problems. So we are defining two standard terms or common terms. One is called CNR, the other is called PNR. CNR talks about the number of ways of doing combination. Uh, how many R combination can we form when we have N total objects 
together. So the C here stands for combination. So it is a number that counts the number of combinations. Similarly, PNR, the P here stands for permutation, and PNR is the number that counts the number of permutation. The N and R here describes total number of objects that we can be choosing, and R is the actual number of objects that we are choosing. Now with these in our heart, so we are now defining these two terms already, so let us make sure that we understand everything. So what is the value of CNN? Now CNN is the number of ways to get n objects out of n objects. So it must be one, right? There's just one way. We need to take them all. So CNN, we are not talking about any formula. We are just making sure that we are understanding the meaning of each term. So CNN, without any idea how this can be I mean, there is later we have a formula for CNN, but we don't need the formula to get CNN. To get CNN, we just need to understand the meaning. So CNN is actually 1. And CN1. So CN1 is we have n objects, and I just need 1. How many, of, how many ways that we can select one object out of n? So there must be n ways, right? We are selecting the first one, or the second one, or the third one, and so on and so forth. This is rule of sum, right? So that there are n ways. How about C32? Now C32 is a small example. So we can label the objects, let's say the label of objects like sun, moon, and star. So we have three objects, sun, moon, and star, and we want to get two of them. So how many ways are there? So by enumerating all the possible number of ways, we find that there are three ways, either sun, moon, or moon, star, or sun, star. Now, in a selection problem, we don't care about the arrangement, the ordering of the objects. So sun, moon is the same as moon, sun. We don't care about the ordering. But here, if we are talking about a permutation problem, so it's a similar problem now. We want to select two objects out of three, but then the ordering among the object is important. So how many ways are there? How many arrangements of two objects to be selected out of three? So Doing some counting, there are six ways. We let's say we use sun moon star as our example, so we can have sun moon, sun star, moon star, and also moon sun, and star moon and star sun. Okay. And we have also a bunch of results. Okay, so we claim that P N R is equal to P R R times C N R. So what is PNR? PNR is the number of ways of selecting R objects and then making an arrangement for it. Oh, this description is exactly what we want. We are selecting R objects and then make an arrangement of these R objects, right? So this is a rule of product example. There are n choose r, so we have cnr, usually we call it n choose r as well. So there are n choose r ways of selecting r objects, and then prr ways to arrange these selected objects. By using the rule of product, sorry, the rule of product, we get the result here. So although we don't have any formula about pnr, we will later talk about the formula for pnr. But then, Without any formula, we still know that this has to be true. And the proof technique that we are using here is called a combinatorial argument. We argue the correctness of an identity by using the meaning, the combination or the permutation meaning of the terms. Now, how about this one? PNN is equal to PNR multiplied with p n minus r, n minus r. So why is it true? So in order to make a full arrangement of n items, one thing that we can do is we can always do something like this. We can make an arrangement of some r items first, and then we make the arrangement of the remaining items. So whenever we do so, we are always getting a particular arrangement of the n items. So in this case, this is another example of rule of product. So we will have this to be true. 
And thirdly, we have CNR is equal to CN and minus R. Now this one is even more simpler. So CNR is the number of ways to choose R objects. So it must be equal to the number of ways to choose which N minus R objects to discard. We choose R objects to keep, it must correspond to choosing N minus R objects to discard. So CNR must be equal to CN N minus R. So we have established a one-to-one -one correspondence between the way that we are counting here and the way that we are counting here. Okay. And, and now let us now let us get our first formula for these uh, combination and permutation terms. So we claim that P N R is equal to N times N minus 1 times N minus 2 up to N minus R plus 1. So this is not easy to remember. The easiest way to remember this is we start from N and we take R terms all together. There are R terms all together. And then each term is minus one of the previous term. So usually there is a notation for this one. We can write it down as n to the power. So I think I, I have described this in the, in the OCW recording. So we can write this as n to the power r, but with a bar below r. So we call this the n falling power of r. Okay, so why there are, why we start from n and why there are r terms multiplying to each other? It is coming from this proof. So we are so here remember this number is counting the number of ways to select our objects and making an arrangement. So the choice of which object is placed or is selected at each time is important. To count the number of ways of doing so, so we find that we are we can do so by selecting the objects to be arranged one by one. First of all, the end choice to select which object to be the first one. And no matter what happens, imagine the tree diagram. So after we have selected the first object, then no matter which branch that we are looking at, there are going to be n minus ways of select the second object. And if you imagine the tree diagram again, for each of these possible choice, there are going to be n minus two ways to select the third object, and so on and so forth. So after making our decisions, so we get a particular way of getting our objects and making an arrangement. So that's why we start from n and then n minus one and so on and so forth, and then we are multiplying our terms all together. So this is actually from rule of product with our tree diagram in our heart. Okay, so. We have two little examples here. So the first one is uh, how many ways to to distribute the price uh, uh, that uh, we have 100 different people to compete in a contest. One of them will, be, will get the first prize, one of them will get the second prize, and one of them will get the third prize. So how many different ways could happen? So altogether, there are P103 ways. Or if you just write it down, Easily, there is going to be 100 times 99 times 98, right? So, so we want to decide who is the first prize, and then who is the second prize, and then who is the third one. Now here, this is a, a slightly um, more complicated example. So we are trying to arrange people on a, on a ring. Okay, so, so let's say 1, 2, 3. We are arranging people on the ring. We want to count the number of different ways of doing so. But then what we care is about the relative order. So if somehow after rotation, so after rotation, we can form this arrangement into this one, then these two are considered to be the same arrangement here. So, so although it looks different from the first glance, but we actually consider them to be the same. So now, so, so how many ways can, can, can we do so to, to form a ring? Okay. So the number of ways, it turns out that it, we can count it in. Yeah, there are two different ideas that we can use to, to solve this problem. You can check 
the OCW recording for it, but I will talk about one of them that is that is uh, for me the easiest to to understand. Because what we know here is that let's say the the, the there are n people, right? So let's say we label the n people starting from one, two, three up to n. And because rotation doesn't matter, so in any case, we know that the person with label one must be somewhere in the ring. So let us define the way that we are represent. Uh, let's get a representation of a certain way that we are we are looking at. So each time we start finding where the person with label one is located, and then go from this person in a clockwise manner and outputting the labels. So in that case, if if so in that case, then we we see that um rotation will not be overcounted because for this one we will call it two three because starting from one we see two and then three for this one it is also two three is that okay the number of ways of doing so means that the number of ways to list all the remaining n minus people starting from one so how many ways can we do so so it is easy it is to arrange n minus one people all together we are selecting them so it is n minus one and then minus uh, and then multiplied with n minus two and so on and so forth up to one and we call this notation n minus one factorial so it is n minus one to the falling power of n minus one and we call this n minus one factorial so n factorial in general is is starting from n multiplied with n minus one and so on and so forth up to they are all together n terms okay okay that's all for what i want to uh, show you today and then thanks so much for for coming and then yeah have a happy nice day a uh, happy nice holiday so the weather is very nice outside yeah and then see you next monday thanks all Thank you. Thank you.